How does muscle memory work? I mean, the term gets thrown around so much, it's difficult to know what it even means anymore, and depending on who you ask, you're gonna get a completely different answer. In fact, we already did an entire video around the neurological aspect of muscle memory. Well, today's video, it's the muscle's turn. We're gonna see exactly how and to what degree muscles remember, and we're gonna discuss why resistance training might just be one of the most important things you can possibly do for your health, regardless of your age. It's gonna be one to remember. Let's do this. We're really excited to share that we have a sister company called Ava that sells anatomical art like this one, and this one, and this one, which is mine and Jeffrey's personal favorite because we have taste and Jonathan does not. If you're interested and want to support the channel, we'll leave a link in the description below. Skeletal muscle tissue doesn't divide, meaning that you're born with as many muscle cells as you're ever going to have in your entire life. Or at least that's been the commonly accepted view for decades. More recent studies are starting to show that there are some interesting exceptions to this rule, but they are exceptions, and by far and large, it still seemed to be accurate that they don't divide. So if they don't divide, when a skeletal muscle gets bigger, what's really happening is those pre-existing cells are becoming hypertrophic. They are increasing in volume. You see, skeletal muscle is unique in that the cells are multinucleated, meaning that one cell can have hundreds to thousands of nuclei to help regulate its cellular functions. This process begins in utero, during embryological development. You have these individual cells called myocytes that fuse together to create one single gigantic, enormous skeletal muscle cell. The fancy word for this is syncytium. And that's where single cells fuse together to create a larger cell with various components that are all working together for a single cause. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is just to provide context as to how skeletal muscle cells become multinucleated in the first place. The real question we're pursuing here is, what happens to that cell during muscle hypertrophy? When hypertrophy occurs in any cell, there is going to be an increase in intracellular components. Now, you're gonna have to forgive me for this because this is an absolute terrible drawing, I'm not an artist, but the orange and pink dots are actually meant to represent intracellular components such as lysosomes, peroxisomes, mitochondria, and for skeletal muscle cells, that would include the contractile proteins called sarcomeres. Well, since the late 1800s, it's been thought that a nucleus has what's called a sphere of influence. That means a nucleus is only capable of supporting a specific cellular volume. So, that means there's an actual size limit for cells because if it gets too big, the nucleus can't handle it and that cell is in a ton of trouble. So you're probably wondering, well then how on earth does a skeletal muscle cell increase in size when you're working out and it becomes hypertrophic? If there's a size limit, how does that even happen? Well the answer is that the skeletal muscle cell steals nuclei from other cells. Real quick, I wanna thank the sponsor of today's video, Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is a nutritional company that makes the nutritional drink, AG1, which is far more than just a greens drink and has become a morning staple for me. AG1 has 75 different ingredients, which includes vitamins, minerals, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens. I just turned 35, which is still very young in the grand scheme of things, but my body's finally starting to feel old for the first time and it's extraordinarily depressing. I mean, look, in the past five years alone, I've discovered I have severe degenerated discs in my low back. I have a literal broken back. I have an abnormally long colon that is all twisted and turned around. I grew scar tissue randomly, we still don't know how, that blocked off my small intestine, nearly killing me. And this last one's actually admittedly much smaller, but. I think I'm starting to get plantar fasciitis and it's really kind of painful. But AG1 is not gonna fix any of those and they don't claim to, but what AG1 can do is provide me with the essential and important nutrition that best positions me to adapt and overcome these health issues on my own. All you do is take one scoop and add it to eight ounces of water and then shake vigorously. It's super important. I mean, it's not actually a part of the instructions, but it makes me feel happy inside, which is all that matters. And then from there, you're just gonna take a drink and carry on with your day. I mean, I'm the type of guy that is all about effortless daily habits. So knowing that a significant amount of my essential daily nutrition has been handled first thing in the morning is a huge weight off my shoulders. If you're interested, visit athleticgreens.com slash human anatomy, and they're gonna give our audience a one year free supply of immune supporting vitamin D3 plus K2 and buy free travel packs with your first 
purchase. Go ahead and find that link in the description below. In 1961, stem cells were discovered that had the ability to fuse with skeletal muscle cells and contribute their nuclei. They were called satellite cells. Now, normally they exist in this state of pause called quiescence. And what they require is a signal to activate. Now this signal could come from say like an anabolic steroid such as testosterone, or it could also come from tissue injury, say through resistance training. But if these cells become activated, what happens is a daughter cell will fuse with the skeletal muscle cell, give its nuclei. The other daughter cell will then pull back and repopulate the satellite pool and go back into that state of quiescence, waiting for another signal. Now this is all great and dandy, but now we have a new question on our hands. What happens if the cell gets smaller? Now you've probably heard of the term atrophy, but this is easily one of the most misunderstood terms in all of biology. Atrophy has nothing to do with cellular death. Instead, it means that a cell is getting smaller. So if a cell undergoes atrophy, let's say from inactivity, there's no need for that extra nucleus. So what will happen is a process known as apoptosis, which is a form of programmed cellular death. So that extra nucleus and the DNA inside of it will fragment. The mRNA will decay, and that is the end of the line for that particular nucleus. For decades, many biologists assumed what's known as the myonuclear domain hypothesis. It's wordy, I know, but the idea is actually very simple. Again, we're gonna pretend that this is a skeletal muscle cell. So if it were to become hypertrophic, a satellite cell just on the outside of it would fuse and contribute its nucleus. Then, if that same cell becomes atrophic, the nucleus dies. It fragments and everything we just discussed, and what you're then left with is the proper nucleus to cellular volume ratio. Makes a ton of sense. Problem is, not every biologist agrees with it. How is it that one of these nuclei suddenly becomes so compromised that its DNA fragments and it goes into a downward death spiral, but its neighboring nuclei are more or less okay? It's a pickle for sure. And then on top of this, when you're looking at this through optical equipment, it's difficult to see or know if the nucleus is inside of the skeletal muscle cell or outside of it. Maybe like a satellite cell or a white blood cell, a fibroblast. It's pretty challenging. It's entirely possible that the other cells, the, the satellite cells, fibroblasts, white blood cells, those are the ones that are actually experiencing apoptosis during muscle atrophy, which would explain the measurable markers of apoptosis that scientists are finding. Well, scientists studying, of all things, a tobacco hawk moth may have finally found the answer. You see, during the moth's normal pupil to adult development, something interesting happens on day 15. Its belly muscles undergo atrophy, losing 40% of its total mass, which is crazy. If that happened to you, you would not be doing well. Here's the thing. The moth's muscles don't have the same satellite cells, fibroblasts, white blood cells that mammals do, meaning that the nuclei that scientists are observing are coming only from skeletal muscle tissue. And when the scientists count the nuclei, they stay the exact same as they were when the muscles were larger, meaning there's no loss of nuclei. Ask yourself this, what's the advantage to the cell for accumulating new nuclei and then destroying them shortly after? I mean, Environmental circumstances can shift very quickly for humans, going from hypertrophy to atrophy, hypertrophy to atrophy. I mean, just think about the lifestyle of a hunter-gatherer. Think about it like this. Why is it that it's easier to regain muscle mass than build it initially? Like, let's say you put the work in at the gym, right? You're lifting weights, you're building muscle mass through hypertrophy, and then, bam, you break your arm playing rugby. Obviously, you're gonna lose the gains in that arm because you're gonna spend the next couple months in a cast, and inactivity is a huge driver for atrophy. Yet, as any experienced gym goer can tell you, it is definitely easier to regain what you lost than build it in the first place. And one of the main reasons that's likely true is the retention of myonuclei. I mean, think about it. All the cellular adaptations for hypertrophy are already in place, except a recent paper published by James Bagley, Kevin Murick, and Andy Galpin suggests that the myonuclei are only retained for a short period of time. However, despite that, the muscles are still able to bounce back easier in the long term, and it's possible this is due to epigenetic factors. Epigenetics is one of the most exciting areas of research in biology and for good reason. You see, DNA doesn't change much, and that's actually a, a very good thing. However, 
we don't actively use every gene in our genome. Instead, there are protein markers on the outside of the genes that act as an on-off switch. And the interesting part is they are heavily influenced by our environment. When you do resistance training, you're telling your muscles that there's an actual environmental need to be stronger and larger. This activates and deactivates epigenetic switches in your genome, making it easier for nuclei to regulate protein synthesis as well as various other factors that contribute to muscle hypertrophy. This is the muscular component of muscle memory. Look, your muscles don't have consciousness, but they're still able to retain information, which can make it easier to rebound in the event of a loss of muscle mass. I want you to take a moment and think about what this means for musculoskeletal health as it relates to aging. Now, Jonathan just did an entire video about resistance training and how it relates to longevity, so please be sure to check that out. But in a nutshell, resistance training isn't about looking good and getting stronger. I mean, those are awesome side effects that are obviously plenty motivating for a lot of people in the world, but resistance training is really about stimulating skeletal muscle so that it can adapt to improve your quality of life and then you wanna maintain that as long as possible. The stronger you are, the less susceptible you are to injury. I mean, it's not like you're, it's impossible to get injured, but you're less susceptible, and that should be enough for people. It's not about looking good and getting stronger. Again, that's awesome, but what you really should be doing when it comes to resistance training is focusing on the quality of life improvements and what that's gonna mean for you going forward. Thanks for watching, everybody. Jeffrey and I really appreciate you hanging out with us. Now. All the resources used to make this video are linked in the description below, including an incredible paper from Lawrence Schwartz that this video was heavily inspired from. Be sure to click the link in the description below to start your Athletic Greens journey today. And also, be sure to check out the link in the description below to our sister company, Ava, that makes anatomical art. I mean, come on, you could decorate your house, your office, your car. Probably not your car. I, I, that's probably not too safe. But all the other places are completely fine. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you feel so inclined, and we'll see you in the next video.